<laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently the voice is out, okay. Uh, when I suggested this little panel, it arises because I've had the pleasure of dealing with two-thirds of these folks already, and they have always been extremely personable, extremely open, and extremely helpful in understanding, helping us understand what is going on with Mars One from the perspective of somebody who actually might sit there and feel a rocket kick them off to Mars someday. So uh, I'll let them introduce themselves, give a little elevator speech, and then we'll just roll through a few questions, I think, that may help guide our thinking and guide our understanding of what, what motivates uh, this level of commitment, which is rare in today's America, uh, not unknown, but rare, and, and what motivates uh, um, the, uh, the ability uh, to, to focus this, this much and to take this much interesting risk. I, I mean, as an aerospace educator, this is just red meat for people who want to learn about aerospace. And so whether or not it succeeds or fails, from the standpoint of an educator, it can't fail. It has to be one of the most interesting technical controversies of our time. I, I, it could read like a Cervantes novel, and on the other hand, it could read like the Apollo program or the Manhattan Project. And it could go either way, and we're sitting here at the nexus of the time when those decisions have to be made if the ambitious schedule is to have any kind of hope for fruition, I think, uh, in, in my view. And so now, so here we are at this point uh, of, of convergence. And so the first effort here is, you know, why, why would people do this? And then the second effort is how and can they do this? Uh, that's the debate that follows. So I would just like uh, Layla and, and Scott and Sonia to tell us one by one their little elevator speech about why they're going to do this, okay? Take it away, Layla. We'll just go down the aisle. Hi, I'm Dr. Layla Zucker. I'm an emergency medicine physician here in Washington, D.C. at Howard University Hospital. And I, according to my father, wanted to be both an astronaut and a doctor since I was three years old. This is before I can remember. Uh, but I have achieved the one goal, and I had thought the second was not going to happen. Uh, my plan had been to become a physician and then become a mission specialist and hopefully go up on the space shuttle. But as we all know, that's not going to happen. And then I got an email from my husband, Ron, two years ago that said, I don't want to tell you this, but I'd feel like a terrible husband if I didn't, and he sent me a link to the Mars One application page, and the deadline was about a week later, and I spent every night working on that application until I had it in on time. So for me, the idea is that I grew up in the Apollo landings era. I expected us to be back on the moon within a decade or maybe two. I expected us to be on the Mars within a decade or maybe two, and that elusive goal just keeps slipping further and further away. Oh, we'll go in 20 years, we said in the 60s. Oh, we'll go in 20 years, we said in the 70s. 80s, 90s, 2000s, and now it's 2015, and it's still, we'll go in 20 years. Well, I say, no, enough. Let's try, let's go now. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> Okay, so I'm Lieutenant Commander Oscar Matthews. I'm a Navy civilian and a Navy reservist. I was born in Spain, and at the age of five, I came over to the US and learned English. Uh, went through the school system and got into the Air Force Academy. Graduated in 2004 and went into operational flying. Got out of the Air Force and went to a master's program in aerospace and got a job as a nuclear test engineer at Norfolk Naval Shipyard on submarines. I did that for three years, and I just recently transferred to uh, Pax River, where I, I do flight testing as a reservist, and I do F-18 systems engineering for the Navy as a civilian. I heard about the Mars One program, I think, via CNN, and I started looking into it, and after a few weeks, I felt that, uh, given my background in aerospace, I knew a lot about the details of it, 
And I felt that the risk was worth the potential payoff. And we need to have a discussion about the amount of risk we're willing to accept as a species to do these really incredible things, like going to Mars. And it was a personal choice, and I accepted uh, full responsibility for my actions, and I applied. So um, I'd like to continue this conversation that we've all agreed is a conversation that's worth having, and I thank you for your time. Switch? There's a switch on it. Hello? Obviously, I'm the tech-savvy one up here, right? <laughs> uh, so my name is Sonia Van Meter. I don't have a cool title like engineer or doctor. Um, afraid I don't have any fancy degrees either. Much respect. Um, I am the managing partner of a political consulting firm. We have offices in DC, in Austin, and Chicago. Um, and I applied for the Mars One project for many of the same reasons that Layla did, certainly um, a deep-seated belief that humans need to be on Mars already. We've been talking about this for 50 years, and it's just time for us to go. Um, I didn't expect to find myself in the Mars 100. I'm, I'm still a little stunned by this. Um, when I think of the kind of people I would want on Mars with me, it includes engineers and it includes doctors. It doesn't necessarily include um, someone who has elected more than a dozen members of Congress to the United States government. That just that doesn't seem like an applicable skill. Um, but then I realized that I guess the applicable, applicable skill that I do have is uh, incredible patience. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and a, a deep love for my uh, fellow humans. Um, and I just, when I heard about Mars One, all I could see was the tremendous benefits to all of humanity if, uh, if we're able to pull this off. So I applied without reservation, um, and here I am. Okay, so what I, what I thought to, to ask are a few questions that maybe maybe everybody's thought about or maybe maybe you haven't but uh, it, it seems to me that where mars one sits at this cusp of of a choice of getting a technical program on the books and doing it on a short time scale and asking a lot of questions and and working through a lot of problems that have not been addressed fully but haven't been left alone either they're in that another world I'd like, I mean, these panelists come to it uh, as customers of the Mars One Enterprise. They ultimately are gonna sit in a seat and somebody is, is going to touch off a rocket and, and that decision point, that little point of intense uh, power density is gonna be uh, something that's either singularly uninteresting for them or singularly exciting for everyone, okay? So if I'm that customer, if I'm, if I'm in this, and you know, I, I'm too old and crotchety, but you know, they get to do what I dreamed of doing and many of us, others of us did, I'd, I'd like to know how they think about their role, even if they're not down selected further. Do they want a role and do they think they can have a great role in helping keep all the astronauts in that core as safe as possible? and in helping define the technologies and what, uh, what things they might think about doing, whether they go forward in the process or whether they don't, and whether or not it's important for people who might not be selected further to stay in the game and stay in the, stay in the process as advocates for the ultimate astronauts in Mars One. So what do you think, anyone? Oh, well, would you, yeah. You've overwhelmed, overwhelmed us with myriad questions, but we'll do our best to grab a couple. Um, I think that all of us have been inspired to go out and do outreach on space exploration to children, to adults, to anyone who wants to have the conversation, like all of you here today. 
what I think is important is the more we talk about it, the more people that get involved, uh, the more criticism we can go through, we can identify the issues that need to be addressed. Uh, last weekend, Oscar and I and another Mars 100, Dan Carey, uh, were invited down to Robeson Planetarium in North Carolina, and we spent the entire afternoon with about 60 4-H kids from elementary school through high school doing hands-on demonstrations about how far away Mars is, how long it takes to get there, what the gravity is, what some of the challenges of a seven or eight month uh, trip from Earth to Mars would present with weightlessness and with technology and what we might encounter when we get to Mars and the difficulties of living on Mars. And you would be astounded at what some of these eight, 10, 12, 16 year olds have thought of you know, they were asking amazing questions, very detailed questions about the technology, about the science. And so I personally will remain involved uh, with Mars One, whether I continue on or not, uh, as an advocate for human settlement of Mars and for all other space exploration, if I can. So that, that trip was actually really insightful. The, the students, um, and this is a core, uh, mission that Mars One has. It's something we should definitely uh, do to try and engage the next generation of explorers, to try and engage our own generation also, but uh, to make sure we're good stewards of their, uh, their hopes and their dreams as well. When we were there, I was really impressed by the level of insight that the kids had as well. We talked about 3D printing on Mars and uh, what kind of benefits using local resources brings to the mission in terms of uh, sparing and, and mass requirements, and they understood it. They, they picked it up and they were totally okay with, uh, you know, using local resources and further developing the technology that many of them had already seen because their schools were starting to use 3D printing and plastics and so forth. And, uh, and so I think um, in addition to maintaining a national conversation, uh, in addition to uh, really defining this one-way mission plan, which uh, is infrequently talked about, then uh, Mars One's place is also to try and engage with students and with young people uh, in addition to the general public. Um, far and away my favorite part of being a part of the Mars 100 so far has been talking to school groups, young children, daisy troops, um, and I'm, I'm sure that other Mars 100 candidates in the room can speak to this. It's so much fun talking to children about this. Their eyes get huge, their jaws hit the floor, they just can't believe that someone is attempting something so grand and so extraordinary. And, um, you know, certainly there are billions and billions of things that have to happen first uh, for this to happen correctly, um, for it to happen at all. But in the meantime, uh, right now, Mars One has really, really uh, caught some wonderful attention and given uh, young kids something to kind of get excited about. Um, I have two stepchildren that are in uh, middle school right now, and their teachers are constantly asking them, what's your stepmom up to? Is she on Mars yet? Um, and, you know, they, they don't know how to feel these questions, of course, but uh, I, I can't tell you how exciting it is to be a part of something that could potentially drastically change the, the landscape uh, for what we've, what we've done and what we'll continue to do in terms of space exploration and colonization. Okay. Well, yeah, that was kind of what I'm, 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 I was looking for, but to be more particular, when you're sitting there and you contemplate going forward in this program, what are the technologies, the crucial aspects of the mission plan that make you think about safety and make you think about how testing should be done and make you think about how you are going to assess the risks and communicate those risks and risk mitigations to others in your, in your, your group? Or, or how are you all going to work, uh, work these problems in your own minds? What are the things that, that keep you up at night when you imagine sitting on that rocket? Okay, so I think everybody in this room who's aware of crewed spaceflight uh, in, our, in our time knows that the average uh, failure rate for rockets, so more on the Russian side and maybe less on the American side, is about 1 in 10. So if I'm on the rocket, I'll be thinking about getting through the launch sequence. The next most critical phase of flight for the journey, for me, would be entry, descent, and landing, because those TRL 
the technological readiness levels for EDL, entry, descent, and landing are the lowest and most undeveloped. So if we can get through launch and EDL, then the next most critical phase would be actually landing. We get through that and we're on the surface and then the real fun begins. Yes. Seriously, I think I'm probably most scared of loneliness. Um, you know, they're, they're planning on setting us up in groups of four, and that means that uh, you're gonna have three people who just became your very, very best friends and worst enemies and uh, closest family. Um, but that's three people for the rest of your life. And when I think about the number of people that I interact with on a daily basis, um, I know there are a million, a million things that could go wrong from, you know, launch all the way to the end of your life. Um, but in terms of the things that keep me up at night, it's the isolation that I think uh, is the most haunting for me. Four more people every two years, huh? Right. <laughs> well, that, that changes everything. Okay. <laughs> It takes a minute. Okay, how about this one? All right. Uh, the only thing that keeps me up at night is that we might not go. I think that there's a lot of people, um, many of you in this room, who have concerns that we're not ready, that while we have the basic technology, there's a ton of development that still needs to be done and that, let's say, uh, along the Mars One mission path, uh, we have a failure. We have a one in 10 failure. And then all of a sudden, the desire to go or the funding to go evaporates. That's what I am afraid of. I'm not afraid of dying on launch. I'm not afraid of dying in space. I'm not afraid of dying on landing. This is what humans have done in exploration for millennia. This is what we were born to do. This is what we're going to do. But. What if we don't? And that's what keeps me up at night. Well, I'm afraid of dying. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, that's why I work hard to be the best I can be at, at the things I do. But um, the, I, think, I think one thing we need to be aware of, maybe not afraid of, uh, or something I'm aware of, is <clears throat> thinking that only NASA can do something as audacious or as grand as going to Mars, for example. It's, it's something that we have within ourselves individually, right, to support an idea that's worth supporting. And it only takes a few dollars from every person on Earth, right, maybe some giving more than others if they, if, within their means. But if every person on Earth, which there's 7.357 billion people right now, as of like yesterday, if everybody gave that money, then that would be approximately $1 billion more than the Mars One estimate, so take that for what it's worth. But apparently, we can use that money to get to Mars. And we don't have to deal with NASA because it's not a NASA mission. We don't have to train like NASA because it's not a NASA mission. It's not a NASA mission. And I'm afraid that crit critiques and, and people who don't understand that are going to derail what is a really beautiful idea and that is that we can self-fund our own mission to the Red Planet. So what we need to do is we need to engage people who maybe aren't supportive right now. We need to bring them on board as partners. We need to maybe address some of their concerns and, and encourage open dialogue and try and be as transparent as possible. But we also have to realize that it's not NASA. And sometimes you're not going to get the data you want the moment you want it. Because even NASA doesn't give you the data you want the moment you want it. <laughs> so I just, I just want to bring that topic up because it's something that I think about. It's something that I care deeply about. I want people to critique the project because it exposes the weakest points of it. Just like I want people to critique NASA because it keeps them in tip-top shape. But there is a point where it goes beyond critique and almost into really almost offensive territory when 
people suggest, for example, I don't know the risks that I'm getting into. And, and so I think we need to be aware that it's a volunteer position that we're signing up for, that the chance to go is a personal choice, right? You're deciding for yourself. No one else has the ability to make that decision for you. And that's, that's where I want to leave it. There has been um, a lot of praise and a lot of criticism of the Mars One project. Um, and, and you know, a lot of it is, is a lot of the criticism is, is perfectly valid. You know, we're, we're talking about doing something that no one's ever conceived of before, um, something that people have been talking about for, you know, more than half a century. Um, it's, it's no small undertaking. And whenever something this large gets attempted, there are going to be critics. Um, but as Oscar pointed out, there's sort of a difference between skepticism and cynicism. Um, and the truth is, I understand both. Um, I am certainly skeptical. I mean, we've got quite a few hurdles uh, ahead of us, um, and I have no illusions that this is going to be an easy process. Um, but the cynicism is, is hard to swallow. Um, and it, it, it bothers me, and I imagine it bothers so many of the Mars 100, because cynicism costs nothing. It's easy to be cynical, it's easy to mock something, it's easy to you know, spit on it and say, ugh, it can't possibly be, and walk away. It costs something, it's an emotional investment to you know, apply to a program like this and then get up on a stage and talk about why you wanna go. Um, that has not been easy, I imagine, for any of the Mars 100. But um, I think as, as time goes by and as we work toward our goal and get closer and closer to this, I think the cynicism will fall away. Um, and I, I look forward to uh, proving everyone wrong. <laughs> I'm sure we, we all look forward to seeing a lot of this uh, naysaying proven wrong or proven right for the right reasons. Uh, you know, it, it, no program like this exists in a vacuum. And even though this is the most ambitious thing you know, outside of NASA that's ever trotted out, uh, it may or may not succeed. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think the cynicism is, is misplaced, but it's a common thing. We love, we, we love these days to, you know, as I may editorialize a moment, we, we love to have overly polarized conversations that really do not bring anything to the process of rational debate. And we see this in our politics, we see it in, in economics, we see it in, in the marketplace, we see it in, in, in religion and philosophy. It seems all the rage to polarize and, and, and strut around and, and say, well, I'm right. But you know, the truth is always in the middle. And whether it's climate change or trying to get a fusion reactor work, to work or going to Mars, truth is always in the middle and it's a process that's important. So yeah, as you guys go through this, and, and you're, you're front and center in, in this process, do you, I think I, I hear it from you already, you seem to like the outreach and engaging with people and all that, but you know, are you mindful or have you thought about some of, the, some of the concrete ways that you can try and make sure that even if the project doesn't go through, you steer it in ways that it leaves its mark so that others can build on it? And what issues or what little subsets of technology do any of you see that are good examples that you'd like to think through and maybe uh, you know concentrate on you know in, in case it doesn't actually pan out? You know, where would you like to, to be? What would you like to be known for as as someone who was uh, part of the the project that didn't quite make it? Where would you like to contribute? Nobody wants to take the microphone on this one. Um, so I think it's going to be different uh, for each one of the Mars 100 and because we all bring different skill sets to it. Uh, as an emergency medicine physician, I've actually looked at continuing uh, a degree in aeros uh, aerospace medicine. We have a fantastic program here in D.C. at GW, um, and I know people in that program. So. For me, it's all going to be about the medical aspects. Um, how that will generate a tangible item, I don't know, but that's the focus I have. And I would continue 
to uh, do outreach, especially on the radiation topic, which drives me up the wall. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would continue to mm -hmm. focus on that, right. uh, both for myself personally, for the field of long-term space flight and how that applies. I'm waiting to see the results of the twin study with uh, Scott and Mark Kelly going on, even as we speak with the ISS, um, and continue taking that information out to the public, right. to school children, to college students, uh, to my colleagues, to all those space enthusiasts, enthusiasts out right. there. So the question, if I understood it correctly, was how do we intend to contribute through subsets of t technology, and how do we intend to contribute by continuing you know, what we're doing? What, what sort of, uh, of the things you might want to add to this thing, whether it succeeds or fails, what, are, what, what little subset of technology do you think you'd like to leave your mark on if, 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 it's not, if, 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 if that's where it, where it sits, if that's where it stops, you know, where would you like to leave your mark? Where do you think it's an important piece of work to, 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 to contribute to as you go forward? Well, apart, for, apart from Mars One, um, right now I'm about to start a PhD uh, candidacy, and my dissertation uh, hopefully will focus on spacecraft radiation shielding uh, and potentially habitat shielding. But um, basically, I'd like to contribute uh, what I can to that field uh, because it's, it's a good marriage of my nuclear test background and my aerospace background. But um, I feel like if we can address some of the concerns despite how we might feel about them, uh, whether or not they're the most critical uh, concern to be addressed, um, then we can start reducing the perceived risk that people have, right? Critics are always going to throw in uh, some sort of risk. And by the time you get done writing the report, they've actually had enough time to find new risks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So it's, um, it's, a, it's almost a battle to try and address the risks faster than they can write them. Uh, but we need to sit down and we need to have this conversation. I just, I was on the NTRS, the NASA Technical uh, Repository of, of, of all these technical papers and I was just talking to Dr. Zubrin at lunch and I saw uh, a roadmap uh, paper from 2002 and it, it went through every single major system that needed to be uh, discussed and engineered. And one of the sections was a section about risk. And the MIT students, uh, the MIT uh, report came out and there's a section that said, what we really need to do is talk about risk. How much risk are we willing to accept to get the return, which is a sustained human presence on another planet, Mars? That's what we need to be talking about. We should have talked about it in 2002 when that paper came out because it was a high level decision paper. It went to all the leadership at NASA and they had the boxes around their key points, and their key points were really dire. And they weren't showstoppers, and they still aren't showstoppers, but the perception of that paper, reading it now with the advantage of all that time in between, is that it still seems like we can't get to Mars. And the fact of the matter is, we've been able to get to Mars for decades. Do we have the human will and the funding to make it happen? That's the question. If this is a question about the technology that I want to leave my particular mark on, um, I would like to point out that it took me 20 seconds to figure out how to turn on a microphone. Yes. I have no business leaving a mark on technology. Or possibly <laughs> testing technology. That perhaps could be my <laughs> contribution. Um, <laughs> when it comes to Mars One, you know, if, if the day finally comes when I'm eliminated, uh, or the day finally comes when you know it is it is abandoned for lack of funding or you know whatever other horrible possibilities could happen. Um, I will certainly continue to advocate for space exploration, right. um, but my skill set is not in in tech or medicine. It's in no. messaging. It's in communications. So I will keep holding up the bullhorn and keep talking about why this is important, why it's worth the tremendous expense, why it's worth exciting small children about. <laughs> Hello? Let's see, this is yeah. a problem solving exercise. Yeah, problem solving. I... <laughs> oh, this is too good. Alright, who's leaning against the light switches? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So I'd like to I'd like to add something because Sonia brings up a, a great point, which I think uh, NASA. I don't think NASA's ever had an astronaut that didn't either have a PhD or more than a thousand hours of uh, fighter jet experience and graduate from uh, TPS, test pilot school. You're in an astronaut selection process right now that does not care that you don't have a PhD. It doesn't care how many patents you have. It doesn't care about how many papers you've published. It doesn't care about any of that. And that's one of the reasons I was excited to apply for Mars One. When I saw that they were willing to consider people on the basis of their capacity to learn, the basis of their human merit to sustain some of these uh, you know, hardships like uh, isolation, and they weren't just looking for a diploma or a credential on the wall, which in today's world I think means less and less every year that goes by. Uh, when I was in the military, my senior and I would have long discussions in the desert, and we called it educational inflation, right? Everyone has a high school diploma. Well, then that's worthless. Everyone has a bachelor's degree. Well, now that's worthless. Everybody has a master's. Eventually, we're all going to be doctors, and we're going to walk around, doctor, doctor, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing to me that Mars One would do that. And I loved it. I loved it enough to think, you know what? This is the right way to approach the whole, body, the whole person concept, right? Look at people for what they can bring, what they can learn. They have, we have 10 years to train. NASA takes people, they've already been trained a certain way. They have to break or potentially reinforce that training because NASA's actually got a pretty distinguished military heritage. But they have, to, what, two years to complete their astronaut candidacy program. Two years. So they better be trained before they get there because they only have two years to learn how to go to space. Well, we can take Sonia and we can take me and we can take Layla and everyone else. And we have 10 years to learn how to be a functioning crew for a lifetime of sustained science research on another planet. We're talking total commitment, not coming back. NASA astronauts go up for six months, they know they're coming back. Worst case scenario, Soyuz trip, a couple of minutes later, they're in the ocean or on land somewhere, waiting to get rescued. They know that psychologically, right? So the fact that a program would, would choose us and, and sort of, no seriously, and sort of train us uh, to be very skilled, very technical, uh, individuals after 10 years is totally different than the NASA concept and I and I really embrace that mm. yeah, yeah it, it's, it's sort of like uh, how, how important uh, another fo uh, following thread is how important to you each in your own minds is the fact that it's sort of a a, a unitary step with no clear path of return. Is that uh, very important in the way you approach it? Uh, for me, I would not consider it that important, but I don't know what you guys think. And, and, but is it, there, is it crucial to, the, to your success, the fact that you're going to make that commitment to never return? Or is it an enhancement? Or is it just sort of a practical matter because rocketry to come back from Mars is one technology you don't have to build, or at least don't have to build soon. So when it comes time to this, when it's part of it, it comes time to meet this irreversibility aspect, what is, how important is, is it to you in your view of the mission? What do you think? Uh, all of the above. <laughs> uh, uh, it, um, it's both not important and important. Um, I would have signed up whether it was one way or not. So from that uh, perspective, not important. Um, but as you mentioned, we don't really have the technology to go and come back. We don't have the Kennedy Space Center on Mars ready to launch the rocket back. But, so what makes it so exciting is we'll just go with what we have now and go, which is very similar, I might add, to probably the ancestors of many of the people in this room. My great-great-great-great-grandparents moved to the New World from Europe. They were never going back, and they couldn't really even send letters for the most part. Those ties were cut, they were moving forward, they were building a new life in a new world. And that's what I find fascinating when people say, but you're not coming back. To me, that is really, not a problem. Um, and it might, in fact, be an enhancement. It's a bug. It's a feature, not it's a bug. It's a feature, not a bug. There you go. 
I think what's unique about the one-way nature of it, like Layla said, we are a nation, America's a nation built on immigration. I'm an immigrant. I'm an immigrant. My first uh, experience uh, in this country was learning English. If you can imagine that. Speaking now to you with, I hope, no accent. <laughs> but when I was 18, I was naturalized because I felt uh, that I had to return some of the opportunity to this country in the form of service to the military. My family had a tradition of military service. I enjoyed the atmosphere, the camaraderie, the esprit de corps that you can only get, I think, in that special way in the military. And it's, it's one way, not because it's cheaper, which it is by a mile, not because it's feasible, which it is by a mile, but because if you're going to spend any billions or hundreds of billions of dollars to go to another planet, then the reason you go to that planet is to do science, to search for life. You don't go and then come back so you can have parades and handshakes and medals, okay? God, that's noble. <laughs> um, I think like both Oscar and Layla, I, it wouldn't have mattered to me if this were a round trip. Uh, situation I would have applied either way. Um, I was just so excited that someone was finally willing to offer the opportunity to someone like me that I had to jump at the chance. Um, but you know, now that I've had some time to sort of think about what Mars One is doing here, um, yes, we need to go and we need to spend a lot of time there. Um, I'm especially excited about the implications for sustainability um, to do with this mission. Um, there, I think the the implications for life here on Earth are tremendous, immeasurable, really, because we're talking about having to make the absolute most use of every ounce of resource that we have on that red rock. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing so much of how this is going to, to develop, but particularly um, you know, Mars One's plans for, for making the most of, of what we have available to us up there. Um, I think that mankind will will reap quite a benefit there. And actually, just to piggyback on what Sonia was saying, uh, within the next 50 years, I believe the population is estimated to go from 7.5 billion to between 9 and 11 billion humans. So apart from the sustainability uh, argument, which I think is a very powerful argument, uh, how, how close can we make the systems for recycling? How, how well can we incorporate new technologies that we've uh, hopefully perfected on Mars into our human systems here on Earth? to sustain those 11 billion potential humans. The ocean is gonna rise potentially 10 feet within the next 50 years. How many humans live within 200 miles of the coast? <laughs> <laughs> right, so if we intend to give all those people access to clean water, give all those people access, ready access to electricity that's generated in a sustainable way, then not only that we need to find more land, an equivalent land mass. Not only do we need to separate the eggs out of the same basket, not only do we need to uh, encourage and give vision and inspire the generation that's coming behind us, but we need to encourage the growth and the support of these technologies that will sustain us for the next 50 years and the 50 years beyond that and the next 500 years beyond that. The other, the other aspect of not coming back is that uh, while you may be quite successful and your numbers may grow, um, do you think that there might be a better, uh, a better coupling between you and the rest of the world if you are sending people back who then can be interacting much as you can now, having had the experience on Mars who can say to so many people, look, we're making it work. I've been there and I've come back and it, it can be, they have, they have the chance then not to worry about 20 minute delay for an email or who knows what, they have a chance to actually see you again. And if no one from the colony comes back ever, is that perhaps missing out on something that's important for ultimate sustainability? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know about everyone else in this room, but I maintain most of my friendships through electronic media. I have friends all over the world that I've never met, that I Skype with, that I email with, that I text with. Mm. I rarely use the telephone for calling, but 
Uh, I, so I, I don't think so, and, and I think interacting, especially the younger the person you interact with, the less they see a disconnect between Skyping with someone and sitting in the room with them. Because to them, it's natural to interact that way. So no, I actually don't think it makes a huge difference. Uh, well, Terry, uh, who knows? Maybe in 500 years, we'll have settlers, the first settlers from Mars. Maybe their grandkids or their great-grandkids will come back. And they can tell the tale of how their family emigrated to a new land. Just like the Jamestown colonists came over from England. And they could have gone back, but they mostly didn't. And now here we are, speaking in English, by the way, and enjoying the benefits of their hard labor, establishing that beachhead of civilization, and cooperating or sometimes warring against the local tribes, and learning how to survive using their wits and the resources they could. But if we don't take the first step, then we'll be like a, a species that never leaves the cave or the area, and it lives and dies in the same exact region never expanding, never learning, just existing. I don't think humans were meant to just exist. Uh, I'm with Layla on this. I don't think it's going to be the end of the world if people go to Mars and don't come back. I think that's probably the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the hardship on the human body, the, the, the toll on the psyche, I just don't think that we're, we're ready for that. I don't think we're physically capable of it to do it multiple times uh, in a life. But I don't think that will stop the flow of information at all. I think... Can't stop the signal. <laughs> no. no I think that, uh, you know, once we start doing things like this on Mars, I think the world will be wrapped. I think they will be so excited and enthralled, uh, you know, with what's going on up there that there, there won't be a way to avoid... Um, New developments and yeah, which embracing will be the great of all of strength. So, one last question, if I may: When you guys step out on Mars, will you have the feeling of of what your what what is n new about this world? Is that going to overwhelm you, or will you have a, a feeling about what you're bringing from the old world to Mars? What do you think is going to be more important in your in your perception or feeling about? Is it this, I'm in a new world, or I've, I'm bringing everything I know of the old world to bring to bear on this problem? What do you think? I think I'm going to be too overwhelmed with thoughts of, holy cow, we did it. <laughs> well, um, all right. well, this also pertains to six months in. I think even six months in, I'm still going to be thinking, holy cow, we did this. Okay. Uh, and if I'm still alive in six months, holy cow, I'm still alive and I'm on Mars. Um, okay. Well, I, it, is, it is always a pleasure uh, to work with you folks, and I, I thank you for your time, and I'm sure we all thank you for your time and insight. And uh, we could go on for uh, quite some time further, I'm sure, but it's time for the, uh, the, technical, the technical debate. So with that, thank you. Oh, okay. Then let's open it up to questions. Yes, sir. Bob Armstrong. Uh, we've talked a lot about your feelings, but like, what about the people you potentially leaving behind? Like, have you had discussions with your loved ones and said, "I'm never going to see you again except via Skype"? And how do they feel about it? His microphone didn't seem to be on, but his question, if I can paraphrase, was, "How are your loved ones going to feel about this whole process?" Yeah. Okay. Well, my husband's the one who told me about it, so I think he's okay with it. He's also a space enthusiast. Uh, if uh, he didn't have asthma, he probably would have applied to go as well. Uh, my family has known I've, I've been an explorer at heart since I was a kid, and I've wanted to be an astronaut since I was a kid. So uh, when I told them about it, they were my biggest fans. They were supportive. And I think if we truly love somebody, then we have to support them no matter what. And as long as they're honest about what their passions are, when they start a relationship, or maybe if their feelings change, as long as they communicate that, then if you're a real human, you will accept them for who they are, and you will support them no matter what. I believe in this mission to the ends of the universe. Um, I firmly believe that we need to be doing this, we need to be doing it now, we needed to be doing it yesterday. Um, 
but I would not be doing this if I didn't have my husband's 100% support. There's no way I would consider it. It's because we have the sort of relationship where we promised to support one another in all of the most outlandish of dreams that we could come up with uh, that I'm even willing to consider this. Um, the minute he tells me not to go, I'm out, but he won't do that. Yes, sir. Um, just a moment. Yeah, uh, my oh. name is Doug Plata. Is it a uh, question for you, if it hadn't been Mars One that approached you, but it had been something like a lunar one that had approached you, would that have made a difference? Is it the destination that matters, or is it simply establishing a, a foothold for humanity anywhere uh, in space? So I think that's a fair question. It's, it's only partially addressed by some of the challenges that you face with crewed spaceflight, uh, because uh, you solve some of the problems by going to the moon, but the moon is so close to Earth that anything that's hitting Earth might very well hit the moon or affect the moon, right? So if something affects Earth, the moon and the Earth are a coupled system. And uh, it's really difficult to survive on the moon because there's uh, a lot of resources that are difficult to get to or just simply don't exist on the moon that are actually quite abundant on Mars. And the only argument that I've ever heard really against going to Mars versus the moon is that it would be easier to rescue potential astronauts from the moon than it would be from Mars. And I've thought about this for a long time, and I've looked at some of the disasters and uh, the problems we've had in space for the past decades, and when things go badly in space, they go badly very quickly, usually. And just because you're in low Earth orbit doesn't provide extra assurance that you'll be rescued or rescued safely. So there's no real distinction uh, to me between um, that argument. If you want to explore, then go to where you haven't been, go to where there are resources, go to where there is a passion and a vision and excitement. It's palpable. People want this. Use that momentum. To quote Randall Monroe from XKCD, the world is probably littered, the universe is probably littered with the one planet graves of cultures who made the sensible economic decision not to go into space, each discovered, studied, and remembered by those who made the irrational decision. We need to go, we need to go to Mars. I would go to the moon personally for personal fulfillment, but for the sake of making us a multi planet species, we need to go to Mars. David Peebler. Uh, the question I have relates to uh, something that hasn't been yet discussed tonight. I find it one of the more fascinating aspects of the planned mission, and that's the TV component. Um, how does that play into everything for you guys? Is it something where you go, oh, okay, everything's great, I want to go to Mars, but the TV thing is, uh -uh. or is it like, cool, I'm going to be on TV, this is going to be great? Because if you really look at some of the things like Big Brother and some of those other things, it gets pretty crazy when you turn a camera on a group of people. And this is going to be a group of people that aren't going to be let out of a courtyard into the real world again. I'm glad you asked that. My initial reaction was, oh, God, I do not want to be on The Truman Show. But this is part of how this mission is going to be accomplished. It's part of the clever idea that might make it feasible. So if that's what it takes, I'm all in. So just to reiterate, the, uh, the recorded part of the funding model is only one part of the funding model. So there's that. Then uh, there's NASA TV. Are, is it going to be like NASA TV? Because that's reality. They're recording reality. I don't know how, what their uh, viewership is. It's probably, yeah, it's probably just us, right? Yeah. But it shouldn't be uh, something that affects you, right? You shouldn't be, if you're the right crew, if there's the, the correct dynamic in the group, then whether or not their camera is recording anything or everything shouldn't matter. You should be the type of person who isn't embarrassed that you are a human being in close quarter contact with other human beings trying to do a very difficult job under very difficult circumstances, right? And if you have good interpersonal ties with everybody, then you can resolve conflict. There's no, there, there will be drama. There will be friction. But that applies to everybody in this room. We have friction in our normal everyday lives, and yet we get through it whether or not there's a camera recording us or not. So, I, run away, though, if you 
Right, you can run away, but, but again, even though it's more difficult, you can... <laughs> Layla is running away, figuratively, right now. Um, you can go on EVA, you can isolate yourself within the, the small close quarters contact that you have. It's not impossible to have privacy. So with that said, you just have to select the correct people, and NASA makes mistakes when it comes to crew selection. Hopefully Mars One can learn from those mistakes uh, and not commit them. But it's a difficult mission. If it were to come down to some sort of drama or conflict, then I would hope that the people would be adult enough to resolve it. I never thought I would meet anyone more optimistic than me, but apparently here he is. Um, I'm, I'm in politics. I'm the person who keeps the secrets. I am a very private person. The idea of having cameras in my face 24 hours a day, 24 hours and 40 minutes a day, um, sounds absolutely excruciating and terrifying. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a small price to pay uh, to be part of this organization, to be part of an endeavor like this. So I'll suck it up. Hello, um, I'm Kurt Chang, I'm Kurt Chang Kaya, and I wanted to ask you, um, you're all very enthusiastic now. You go to Mars, and in real life, someone's going to not work out. Someone's going to want to go back. Someone's not going to get along. Have you thought about how to handle that? How would you, how would you handle a situation like that? You got the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> So I've been labeled the optimist. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I think, I think you're making an assumption that it won't work out, but um, I think it's fair to say that there probably will be difficulties. So if it's a permanent situation that can't be resolved, then you just have to deal with it. I don't, know, I don't know, really know how to answer that question, actually. I'm sorry if that's not a good answer. <laughs> Compassion and patience and tolerance. Um, I imagine over the next 10 to 12 to 20 years as we train for this, um, we are going to be put in some really, really unpleasant situations um, for precisely that reason, to see who can, who can stand it, who can survive under incredible duress. Um, I don't imagine... I, I'm sure that, that Mars One is going to do their absolute best to select people that are built for crazy extreme circumstances. Um, but at the end of the day, once you're up there, you are up there. So I imagine it's probably going to be similar to dealing with toddlers. You just sort of grin and bear it and stroke their hair and tell them to breathe and maybe, you know, <laughs> feed them a Xanax. Whoops, whoops, whoops. So uh, again, as the medical doctor keeps coming back to that, what part of what drew me to the Mars One project is Dr. Norbert Kraft, who's the chief medical officer. Uh, he's been for decades working on uh, isolation, long-term isolation, with an eye towards long-term space flight. I've read several of his papers. He really knows what he's doing. He's worked with NASA. He's worked with, I think, the ESA. He's, he knows what he's doing. To the best uh, that humans can possibly select a team that can, a team of four and potentially additional four every two years that can go to Mars and stay there permanently and function as a cohesive unit and deal with all of the challenges that we all know are going to happen. Uh, I think that he is the one person who is best equipped to do that and the team that he will collect to assist them will include many of the people in this room and we're all gonna make sure that we choose the best possible team. And yes, there will be challenges, but you don't see people at say the Antarctic Research Station breaking down. No, they're scientists, they have goals. They're there for a reason. We will be on Mars for a reason and you will have that to hold on to during the tough times and that's why it won't be a huge problem. Okay, well, one more question? One more question. We have to have it on the mic, hold on. Last question, one person gets to answer, short answer, please. Uh, hopefully I can make this uh, something you guys can answer quickly. 
Um, at least two of you mentioned the, uh, you know, uh, anything to do with the radiation. What is your answer to that question? Because two of you seem like you have a very definite answer to that. So I thought I'd ask you guys and see. So the short answer for radiation is to minimize exposure by not going outside. If uh, we smoked, for example, on Mars, then our risk of total lifetime cancer would actually be 40% higher than it would otherwise be. And right now, <clears throat> based on low energy models, admittedly, uh, the total lifetime risk that we're willing to accept is between 1 and 3%, so a whole body dose. The principle we follow is low is reasonably achievable. If your mission requires you to accept slightly higher risk for massively higher returns, then that's something you have to talk about, mitigate, and execute. And uh, it's not something that should stop the human species from exploring another planet. And even if it ends up injuring or affecting an individual, it's an individual's choice, they're volunteering, it's an individual's choice to execute the mission because the mission comes before uh, some of these risks, like radiation. The good of the many outweighs the good of the few or the one. We know the risks. If you look at the data that the Curiosity rover collected en route and on Mars, you can crunch the numbers. It's all available on NASA. We would have approximately half of our radiation exposure en route, and over the course of going outside for three hours a day for the following 10 years, we get the other half of our total risk. So no, barring a solar flare, I don't think radiation is an issue. Okay, thank you very much.